Yeah. So now we are more or less uh, 17 members in the call. So we will start and then maybe others will join later. Hello all. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Today, uh, Anubhav Jain. Uh, he is a PhD student uh, from DTU and uh, he joined one fall recently uh, in grid studies team. So he will be working for one fall for five months, uh, mainly on uh, black start uh, capabilities of uh, wind turbines. So in this meeting, in this presentation, he will uh, he will present his previous work on grid forming uh, wind turbines and then uh, black start capability. Uh, mainly uh, considering HVDC connected wind farms. So Anubhav, um, you can introduce a little bit and then uh, proceed. Hi, uh, I'll start sharing because I can present then my background also in the project, the scope of the project also in the presentation. Okay, so you should see my screen my presentation now. Yeah, can you put your microphone a little bit closer to your mouth? I think. Is it better now? Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, OK, so so welcome all and thank you all for joining and sh well showing interest. Um, my name is Anubhav Jain and I work uh, currently as a PhD student in DTU in wind energy department with Professor Nikolaus Kutlulis. Um, I, I'm working on the black start and islanding capabilities of offshore wind power plants, mainly HVDC connected. And uh, this, this project is part of a, a EU Horizon, Horizon 2020 project called in ODC, which I'll also give you a brief overview of in the coming slides. So very fast background. Uh, overview of, of my how my journey has looked at least uh, as a, in, from a career perspective. I did my studies in in India in the in Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, mainly my interest was electrical engineering, focusing on power electronics, power systems, and solar solar uh, solar as a renewable energy application. Um, after that, I did during that time. I also did some few internships, got some insight into how uh, research in industry works and also how uh, the business unit functions. And then after that, I decided to pursue masters from uh, the ETH Zurich in Switzerland, where I went more close to the let's say to the device level, uh, focusing on power electronic converters. Uh, so studying the controls and design of, of high power electronic converters. Um, after that, I got a bit sidetracked from this, uh, this renewable energy, electrical engineering uh, goals that I had uh, from my bachelor's and master's. And I did some uh, distraction, well, learning, learning in learning how to make web web softwares connected to the database in C sharp in Maxon Motors, which is a, a high precision motor company in, in Switzerland. Um, so I was working on something similar to what Vattenfall has called the wind web portal, which I recently have been looking at. Uh, so it's a similar kind of tool that they had in mind. Um, I couldn't take over the entire project because the Swiss labor laws were a bit uh, restrictive. So then I end up also doing some, some uh, ex taking some experience in robotics and synthetic biology. So this was more uh, from an interest point of view. But what it helped me is to give me like a very condensed uh, uh, view of how a PhD project looks like, going from brainstorming. Uh, and then to to developing the plan and then making initial studies and then detailing them and then ending up with uh, a kind of a some prototype that will of course be taken uh, forward by others and then i ended up joining uh, dtu in in wind energy um, this was a good opportunity for me because uh, having had some uh, 
few years in in the solar uh, field, working in the solar field. I this wind was a good uh, alternative or uh, to compensate in terms of the global renewable energy area. And then uh, this time two years, well three years now, edit you have been really uh, rewarding, except for the corona. Of course, uh, really lockdown as we all have had some some impact from. Um, so we ha I had planned uh, planned external stay with Vattenfall during this this PhD as part of the project because Vattenfall is also a partner in, in our consortium, uh, which didn't happen because of the lockdown. And so it's it's very nice that I could come back and now for five months work on. Uh, uh, what we we had uh, sort of planned. So now to give you a very brief context of the the, pro the overall project that my PhD is part of, uh, it's a EU Horizon 2020 project, something similar to Meadow promotion projects that maybe some of you or uh, know of or have participated it in in different capacities and. It's uh, it's it stands for innovative tools for offshore wind and DC grids. So on a, on a more broader outlook, it it focuses on addressing challenges associated with high offshore wind integration in the power system to meet the climate goals, uh, mainly through to DC connected uh, transmission systems, and it consists of 14 ESRs, so early, early stage researchers, and they are split across three work packages which uh, one work package works on the, the components and devices used in DC grids for the transmission system of the wind power plant and also uh, for connecting to the existing AC grids. Uh, second work package which I am which my project is part of um, focuses on large offshore wind power plants. So doing uh, studies on control, stability, uh, optimization from the technical and economic perspective. Uh, and so on. And then uh, the the third uh, work package is mainly looking into how uh, the existing AC grids and the upcoming or in how the future power system will look like uh, with DC grids, how they can they will interact and uh, from uh, from operational control and protection, especially a protection uh, point of view. On the right, on the right graphic you can see um, the the different ESRs so uh, the, the the names are these are just names of different uh, ESRs like me and what what we did is we tried to place them based on their focus area so it gives you a, a sort of an insight into who is working where um, feel free to use these links um, to learn more about the project and to uh, see more other work packages and uh, get in touch with other PhDs who are of interest to you specifically. So um, now that I've given you a brief overview of the scope and uh, an introduction of myself, I'll get into the, the project or into my project. Um, I will highlight the major outcomes that we have had in the last previous few years and then what we are currently working on right now and how that links to what Wattenfall, my, my stay at Wattenfall. And please feel free to interrupt me for more details because I have not planned it much for time. Um, it's more I hope to be, I was looking forward that it becomes a more of a discussion. And so you can please feel free to interrupt me for any questions or clarification or doubts. Um, and then we can see how how it goes. So a, f a fast summary, a concise summary, I'll, I'll present to you in essentially in form of papers that we have published. So how we started is we began with kind of doing a literature review on what the major motivations for this uh, grid forming wind turbines and islanding operation of wind turbines uh, and their capabilities should be. And then kind of looking into or defining an energization sequence and uh, the target states as they as they call it in power system restoration of the whole sequence and then identifying challenges and possible solutions that exist 
for each state. And you can you can find the papers uh, in these links, but uh, there are also more deliverable reports and videos and whatnot that we have published, uh, which is all available on the site. So feel free to have a look. And then after that, we looked at the we did a review of grid codes and other such network uh, restoration recommendations that have recently come out from some TSOs that give you that gave us a overview of what requirements black start units have and what current wind turbines are capable of. So this kind of uh, highlighted uh, the gap that exists and what needs to be uh, changed uh, or what what is required from from wind turbines to to meet those requirements. Then uh, we moved on to the performing some studies. So we first started with a very uh, not so detailed study, but trying to see the entire sequence and if um, wind turbines or if they are capable of dealing with the transients of energization all the way up to the onshore grid. After which then we focused on the grid forming control of wind power plants, so looking at different controls and how they behave during these transients of the energization. And then finally, also the HVDC link transients, so studying different methods of uh, energization of the offshore network. I will not show you uh, uh, the results of this in the in the next slides. But starting with the the motivation, so we it's it's very clear that uh, the decarbon decarbonization aims and sustainability goals are pushing forward the 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 move from different countries and different in different sectors also to change to to renewable energy sources um, the power system is is a major player in this and we have had now thermal power plants being replaced by renewable energy sources uh, which leads to more complex uh, operation because of their inherent inter intermittent nature. Plus, the, the transmission and distribution system is becoming more and more decentralized, so consumers are more uh, active or participating more, and there is sort of a bi-directional power flow now in the grid, um, due to which operation has become uh, a bit different, if not if not more challenging. And then finally, Power electronic systems uh, are being more in, in, are, are being interfaced more and more um, because of their control functionalities that they allow, but this leads to uh, different sort of uh, aid, a regime of dynamics or faster dynamics, and therefore uh, inner instability issues pop up and more and more nonlinear interactions come across are being are being uh, are challenging to the the operator. This. All this has uh, led to increase risk of wide area blackouts. Now, I'll, I, I think most of the people here might be already in, uh, aware of what a blackout is, but just in case somebody is uh, wondering what we are thinking of, is that it's just a um, area of a grid, typically a very large area going without power supply. So. This can happen due to many reasons, but uh, it it's not as frequent because power system operators try to avoid it at all costs. And there's a lot of contingency plans and stuff that avoid this stage, but it, it does happen and it has happened uh, in the last few years also. Uh, so it's a high impact and low probability event. Why high impact? Because it when it does happen, it can lead to a lot of economic slow down uh, because now everything, almost all services that we have now depend on electricity and it is kind of uh, the fuel for our future, uh, wherever it is sourced from. So there's a huge disruption in livelihood, a lot of economic losses. And of course, in the largest blackouts that have happened in history, even hundreds of millions of people have been affected over uh, quite a long number of hours. Some recent examples um, are the one, for example, in South Australia, in which due to weather um, or, or 
I should be more specific, but due to a tornado, there was a damage in the high voltage transmission lines and that led to some faults and then finally a wind power plant tripping, which then, so the ultimately what it what happened is that there was a very sudden reduction from the wind power plant generation, which led to a system split and this, this led to some uncontrolled islanded operation and, and thus uh, triggering a, a partial blackout. Um, about I think 900,000 people were affected and it caused large scale disruption. But uh, so a lot of study has been done there as far as the, the participation of or the involvement of wind, our large wind farm in a blackout uh, scenario. And quite some interesting results have been presented there, which I will talk about later. But what power system operators then do in case of a blackout or a potential blackout is they, they use something called as a black start unit, which is a device that is or a smaller generator like pumped hydro storage and gas turbines that do not have as much requirement of auxiliary power supply and then they can they can be started up quite fast. So then this would supply the auxiliary power for large thermal plants and uh, which takes quite some time. Uh, about I think 24 hours is the aim in which power system operators aim for at least uh, the backbone energization, but uh, the ultimate power generating module that deals with the large uh, the, the energization of the transmission assets and then picking up the block load is the thermal power plants. And so this is how it looks like step by step, um, but the, the idea is that since thermal is being or large conventional power plants are being phased out and due to well due to aging assets, rising fuel costs, the carbon footprint, uh, decreasing load factors. So the, the, the question is that can wind power plants, uh, especially large offshore wind power plants be used to to provide this service or at least participate earlier on in the restoration procedure? So this was the first, the main the motivation that we started, that the project started with. So it was more from a, the TSO perspective or the grid perspective in that given the changing energy landscape, the cost of warming up large thermal plants and thus of Black Star services is increasing. And therefore there is a need uh, and also I think now a demand from the grid operators to to allow or to enable the participation of alternate sources, uh, whether it be distributed generation, uh, renewable energy sources, etc., to into the Black Start market. And large offshore wind power plants are quite uh, suitable candidates for this, or are, are deemed as very suitable candidates because of uh, their the control functionalities that the Powertronics allows, and then also the fast ramp up times with full control um, from their from the uh, HVDC state of the art wind turbines. But there is a gap that is to be filled and uh, the next study that we did was to try to review uh, grid codes in, in, the, in the scope of network restoration, which is a bit hard to find. It's not that clear. It's not really uh, or at least for me at the time was not really easy to to find, but there were some very new documents, especially from ILIA and National Grid regarding um, uh, the recommendations of for for Black Start units, especially keeping in mind uh, alternate sources like aggregated units like large offshore wind power plants uh, or onshore wind turbines, etc. And we kind of compared them with uh, current technical capabilities of wind turbines to try to find uh, a gap in how these wind turbines and wind farms can be used in the different stages of power system restoration, especially energizing the system. So starting up on their own and then uh, propagating the voltage, which means to energize the cables, the overhead lines, etc., and then picking up block load uh, with first islanded operation and then resynchronizing to the to the main grid so this was the this was the scope and um i i think it's it's a lot of text in this in this paper that we had so i'll not give you a lot of details but um 
if required i can always bring up the paper in this meeting whenever someone wants to know a bit more but the major conclusions was that mm, most articles do not really focus on the participation of wind turbines in power system restoration especially in the earlier stages there's a good reason for that um, but most of them uh, the grid code requirements are on the power control, the reactive support, uh, frequency control, now even inertia response and um, power oscillation damping, for example. But their participation in power system restoration is not that much uh, uh, decided yet, right? Uh, there are a few countries like with, with high wind with penetration like Denmark, Germany, or who have experience in uh, using a lot of wind, UK, Ireland being island systems that do have uh, wind power plant specific regulations. But yeah, again, power system restoration is not really um, a, a need for them to participate in. But the, the, the major um, change for, for wind turbines or wind power plants to be able to actively uh, participate in power system restoration uh, very early on in the stage is that uh, there should be some grid forming control uh, that that needs to be uh, implemented and this this was a uh, two three years ago so now already there has been a lot of progress in this and um, I will explain a bit more in the coming uh, in the in the in the next slides but essentially it's it's that the the wind turbine has a backup power which is called a self starter in black start unit terminology and that would mean like a battery storage or even diesel if that's not replaced yet um, to to ramp up the wind turbine so to operate the wind turbine uh, auxiliary systems etc and then uh, once that is powered up wind turbine can behave as the main power generating module to provide uh, the power system restoration, deal with energization of the cables and pick up load and so on. So one one aspect of this is the reactive power demand. So wind turbines right now can, I think, um, deal with the array cable, the, the offshore network uh, cable charging uh, reactive powers. And it's the, but there is, I think, National Grid um, had a, had a, uh, input or an insight into this is that there is a gap in the charging of long AC cables, export ca the export cables. So all the way up to the onshore uh, onshore sub onshore station, and then even the the many kilometers of overhead lines, etc., till the ultimate the end point of connection. So there's a lot of AC length that that is um, that can be could be challenging for the offshore wind farm wind power plant and this is one reason why we are also looking into hvdc connected wind power plants because there you sort of decouple the mm, the systems and then it becomes more like a hvdc interconnector so i don't know if it's easier or not but uh, there is there is a, a challenge there uh, especially in ac connected wind farms of course, new grid codes uh, like in Germany, Spain, UK, I think they, they are demanding more and more uh, requirements like uh, inertia, synthetic inertia, reactive current injection, etc. And so these, these do drive how also the wind turbines uh, manufacturers implement their capabilities. And that's why uh, this sort of study was seen as a, as a way to kind of initiate some sort of a dialogue between power system operators and OEMs to kind of push more uh, their the wind power plant being participating in power system restoration. And then of course there is the the need that wind turbines be able to deal with transformer uh, in rush transients and its associated uh, problems which can be overexcitation and then resonance especially due to presence of uh, long uh, high voltage uh, cables and uh, so so a lot of studies um, uh, it, it's not that wind power plants are not capable of this but there is a need for investigating this in in the scope of um, energization up to the onshore grid 
one important thing is that during this energization um, since there is no load before uh, reaching the onshore step load the main load that the wind farm has is um, that's the auxiliary load of the offshore substation the hvdc uh, substations and its own wind farm load but so which is not much so there is a inherent curtailment that will be or, or derated operation of the wind turbines and during for some time till the energization is complete and this we have not looked into and will and at least we it's not in our scope to look into because this will have an impact on the, the mechanical uh, load and control side and what they are capable of uh, but but what i i think uh, have heard at least in the beginning talking to people uh, word of mouth is that it is possible and that it is uh, it's not an important uh, uh, limiter but then of course there is also a need from the market to provide some some benefit or some economic uh, compensation for the wind power plant operator to uh, because it will not be generating the maximum power that it can and therefore that that leads into the black start i think ancillary service market or a special network restoration service market um, so this is one important but these are more long-term studies i think after the technical challenges are are uh, looked into then again bringing back the south australia blackout um, they have a very uh, detailed report uh, amo and the operator there and they they talk a lot about uh, that they that although although the wind farm wasn't able to do island operation and tripped and led to and then therefore the problems came but it is uh, possible uh, that with some changes some settings changes that it would have survived uh, better and so this kind of investigations then have are, are also important so uh, to to make to, to to see measures that can allow stable controlled islanded operation from wind turbines and um, i think siemens gamesa and scottish power renewables who have recently demonstrated on an on onshore wind farm um, complete grid forming operation without any external uh, grid uh, they have also led to some similar conclusions that protection settings are uh, are need to be looked into or need to be changed and especially in areas where there is high wind power penetration um, and also i think they even talk about having some passive load just for the sake of allowing this operation um, so burning of energy uh, one one really nice uh, discussion that i was part of through um, i think it was promotion um, where we were talking with uh, TSO and this is apparently uh, possible that so for example for pump storage hydro there is a uh, in general for black start units in in at least in belgium there is a requirement that they should be available for 24 hours right um, they should be on supplying power for 24 hours but this is not valid for pump storage hydro because um, as soon as the black start unit starts to energize and then starts providing power other uh, other non black start units or other generators with, with non black start capability will connect and then uh, start sharing the load and then participate in the energization this is important because otherwise you would exhaust the stored water volume of the pumped storage plant right so similar relaxations I think operators are uh, willing to provide even for wind power plants. Um, at least that's what I uh, what what I heard in the in the meetings. So so that was very encouraging to see. In that um, there is a need from their side also to meet midway. So just to uh, bring back to the. The, the the main topic of this main focus of this presentation being grid forming the the main idea is that the main gap is that currently wind turbines are grid following which means that there is an external grid that provides the voltage and 
the wind turbine connects purely as a current source. Of course, through additional controls, this provides a lot of other uh, support functionalities at the point of connection, but it is mainly uh, that it is controlled as a current source, supplying as much power as it can or as much power as it is requested to. However, in the absence of uh, external grid, there is a fundamental change in the control philosophy needed that will allow the wind turbine or the wind power plant to behave as a voltage source and then supply its own, let's say, island in an island. And uh, during this last few years, I have also, uh, as more and more, I started to talk with uh, Vattenfall actually in, in March in last year. Um, there is also uh, a motivation from the wind farm operator side, so not caring about the Black Star service at all, but why grid farming wind turbines can uh, be useful for the for the wind farm itself is that now they do not need to rely on on an external grid voltage point so they don't need to wait for some for some other voltage to to provide uh, to to allow energization or to keep their own to keep themselves warm in some sense so this kind of reduces uh, health risks uh, reduces the cost of warming and can even uh, if not eliminate, then at least minimize the dependence on the offshore backup diesel generators that are present for auxiliary power. And this could, in in the best case, let's say, um, yield economic benefits, of course, and uh, uh, save offshore space, which I understand is um, pretty expensive. And uh, also the associated problems that come with diesel generators, requirement of refueling, et cetera, et cetera, insurance costs, et cetera, can be uh, can be uh, maybe at least minimized or or avoided. And then ultimately it also adds to the to the uh, so replacing an offshore offshore diesel generator will also provide some CO2 displacement and thus improve the footprint, especially during um, unscheduled outages, which I guess can last a uh, few months, so, so that uh, is a is an interesting uh, motivation. Of course, these studies are more long term and would be uh, done after the technical aspects are are solved. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I think, uh, for example, even having I don't know ten grid forming wind turbines in out of out of in a wind farm is can can give more reliability than having one or two diesel generators maybe so these kind of studies reliability studies then dependence on of 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 the service on whether how inter intermittency can impact the and how that can be mitigated are some interesting um, uh, studies to be done so um, before now before the here what I show here is a schematic. I I apologize, but I assume everybody is um, uh, familiar with it. So this is a typical type four wind turbine schematic, and then wind power plant uh, connected to the NHVDC, a point to point HVDC link to the onshore grid. Uh, so what I show here is that before the wind turbines can provide this onshore. Uh, block load black star service or block load and or energization capabilities there's a lot of stages that uh, we have to go through and ensure proper safe operation um, before reaching the onshore grid and this is what we kind of define as target states as in different stages uh, in sort of the offshore restoration um, sequence and it starts with the wind turbine self starting. So using the UPS, it, it has to power up the auxiliaries, the controls, etc., cetera, and, um, and then synchronize with other wind turbines and then finally energize to the onshore grid. And there are many challenges across the way, um, which I can now go into step by step. So the first stage is self start, which is as the name suggests, the wind turbine starts up from its backup UPS, um, or 
some storage or other other such um, auxiliary power sources and once the once the rotor is oriented to the wind and assuming of course we assume that wind is blowing right and um, once that is done the rotor can start producing power and start uh, sustaining itself so start to energize the wind turbine transformer and kind of operate in some sort of a house load operation um, so after the ups has energized and uh, the rotor is oriented in the proper wind direction and the wind energy can start flowing uh, we we can use the grid forming capabilities uh, of the grid side converter to form its voltage and then energize the local load and operate in a sort of a house load operation but uh, and this is different to the normal mode of operation in which uh, the rotor side would then be um, just tasked with controlling the wind turbine desilink voltage and does um, allow, uh, well, does have to operate in sort of a derated, the wind turbine is operating in a derated um, mode. And uh, one important thing is to avoid overspeeding. So that's uh, that's on the mechanical side. Uh, these, side these sort of controls need to be investigated uh, with, uh, with um, I mean, to, to see if the loads are not uh, exceeding their the, the limits. And once the once such many or few wind turbines have started to self sustain themselves, we can start using the energy from the wind to energize the cables uh, and start synchronizing with other grid forming or grid following wind turbines. And this is um, uh, sort of something like uh, now like an offshore microgrid if you if you want to call it that but at a much more higher power level and uh, much more number of units so we we kind of uh, have to look into the transients associated with the synchronization and energization of transformers with cables um, leading to possible resonances and so on and so forth uh, and this is this is a um, very that's a technically interesting step I think from from a control point and stability point of view and once the the wind the wind power plant or wind farm can, is started to has started to operate as a as a voltage island then we can even uh, energize then then it has to operate in offshore grid forming mode which is essentially that it's uh, it controls the voltage on the offshore grid um, in a stable and robust manner. Uh, so, so ensuring that um, it is there is robustness to falls and uh, resonance and harmonic instabilities and other control interactions that can happen from this uh, in this power electronic rich uh, offshore grid. Um, and then, uh, once when when the when the grid um, demands this, let's say the Black Star service, energize the HVDC cable and finally provide the, the step load. Um, but this this controlled islanded operation of the offshore grid is, I think, is a is the most important um, step because this is where uh, the the wind power plant has to ensure um, robustness before the power system operator can rely on it as a power generating module in let's say the early stages of the network restoration. Um, so, um, so there are different challenges associated and um, now I'll start to go into the, the technical details, show you some results that we have. And um, yeah, again, please feel free to, if I'm not, if I'm available, in terms of the connection to to ask any questions and I I have um, also I may not have all the results in the presentation, but I have papers that I can just uh, share or bring it up on screen and then we can have a look uh, whether be it part of the meeting or uh, one one on one. Uh, 
So here what we first started with is um, a very sort of overview study in which we have some assumptions. So in terms of the details of the models that have been implemented, one assumption, for example, is the the most the most important assumption is that the wind power plant is or the wind turbines are um, uh, not detailed models, and we we just represent them as um, voltage sources uh, being so they being an average model, but implement the grid forming controls to see if that is able to. Um, energize the HVDC link and then participate in the onshore grid uh, taking uh, picking up the step load. Uh, the HVDC link is uh, a CIGRE a general benchmark model, so with all the controls and details um, in the in the MMC converters and the transformers. So the first step is the wind turbines starting up. Now I have not shown it here, but um, our model is uh, a partial aggregate model, so it has a string of wind turbines and then an aggregated string and then some aggregated representation of the re remaining wind turbines. But what we do for this, for the scope of this study is that we en energize them or start them up simultaneously. So there is no, which is, which, is, which is not a realistic scenario, yes, but the aim is not to look at what's happening inside the wind farm, but to see if Assuming they have synchronized and are operating in parallel as a sort of a, if not not stiff, but a strong enough voltage island, can they then deal? How do they deal with the energization transients? So at time zero, we uh, all the wind, power, wind turbines are running and have formed the offshore grid voltage. Then we connect the HVDC transformer, and uh, uh, this is another. Um, uh, study that I will present to you afterwards. So you can do it in multiple ways, in many different ways, energizing the offshore grid. Um, but here we do it in a, with a breaker and uh, there's a PIR to limit the inrush. And once the MMC cells of the on offshore uh, MMC are charged, as you can see here is it is de-blocked to control the DC link voltage. So once these wells are pre-charged, we start to control the 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 diesel link voltage. Um, this then leads to pre-charging of the onshore MMC uh, from the DC side. Now this is a a bit different to how the MMC cells of the offshore MMC were pre-charged because they were from the AC side, and what we understand is that AC side pre-charging is a bit easier. So on the onshore side, if there is a presence of a diesel auxiliary, that can also be used. I think some studies have been done which depend on that for precharging. But what we show here is um, typically that uh, wind power plant that even without diesel, we can do that. Although there is a need for a bit some a bit special protocol here before we can then form the uh, Offshore, offshore grid, and then finally pick up the block load. Um, and here you see the waveforms. Um, uh, we can come back to these during questions if if required. But uh, yeah, so this is this is an overview of the study and uh, kind of focusing on more the HVDC side. So looking into the, the precharging and the energization um, of the offshore grid, assuming. A very uh, any grid forming control on the wind power plant. So afterwards, we looked into the offshore network energization. So this can be done in two ways, or two popular ways exist uh, right now, which is the hard switching, in which you have the offshore wind turbines form uh, operating at or have created one per unit voltage. And then you connect a main breaker to insert the HVDC transformer and the, the cells uh, and the MMC valves with a PIR. So this is needed to reduce the inrush transients, for especially from the HVDC transformer. And after some time, you bypass the PIR and start to, once the, once the energization is done, 
alternatively um, and of course here we in in this study we also what we did is did a sensitivity analysis so checking different values of the PIR and uh, the bypass time uh, and how that impacts the the transients uh, I will not show the waveforms here but um, um, if if needed we can always talk about it um, I can just bring up the paper and alternatively for the soft start case um, the entire network is connected from the start so this is not there and we ramp up the well the wind turbines ramp up their voltage in a controlled manner from zero to one per unit and this again is uh, can be uh, we can study the sensitivity but um, it's it's a relatively more simpler process in in its in the in the terms of the connections and then once the offshore mmc cells are precharged we can then the, then the process is the same for from from uh, up to the onshore grid in in which first it is deblocked so you start to switch it and then control the deceiling voltage and then um, you you have a sort of a let's say a bit different protocol to precharge the onshore MMC cells from the DC side. So assuming there is no diesel auxiliary. Uh, so assuming there is no diesel auxiliary, you, you precharge from the DC side. And then once they are uh, charged to their rated voltages, you can then switch and form the onshore uh, voltage and then be ready to um, pick up block load in, in the scope of um, power system restoration. So. Uh, time for some results, yeah. Uh, hard switching is the most common. Um, and in this, as I talked before, the wind turbines, well, the, the network connects at one per unit, right? Or a bit lower than one per unit for, for some um, safety issues. But on the other, uh, on the other hand, the soft start case, um, we ramp up the voltages with the entire network connected from the start, right? So typically, um, this is of course um, what we try to see from the sensitivity analysis. But typically, uh, the hard switching has a higher transient peak. Um, because it is being energized at a, uh, at one per unit voltage, right? But the benefit is that after the initial transient is 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 uh, is done, more turbines are online, right? So before the upstream energization begins, there is enhanced robustness in present because of uh, more wind turbines already connected. On the other hand. Uh, well, also um, it is why it is also used more commonly in the field. I think is because um, because of its well sequential nature and boundedness. There is any any failed component, any fault can be detected much more easily, right? Because you know that it's uh, in this area or in this area or so on. Um, on the other hand, soft start, although it does ensure lower transient peak and does reduce stress on the on the uh, turbines but there is a sense of unsafety i think uh, that is a word um, because the upstream infrastructure is exposed to more longer um, for a longer time to below rated voltages while requiring i think increased auxiliary power during this energization till till the one per unit is is reached and one important thing is also that there is lesser fault current available um, in during the during the soft start. So protection settings uh, is, is very essential to change or to have uh, protection settings different from case to case. I think um, because uh, because uh, yeah to have more selectivity for some critical faults and um, yeah otherwise it can I think. Uh, increase the likelihood of delayed fault credence and su such studies have been done also for example by Scottish Power Renewable with with their onshore um, uh, grid forming winter wind power plant tests and also 
um, by I think the National HVDC Center. They they looked into this, but with not a wind farm uh, on the generating side, but just uh, as a, an HVDC connector doing the energization. So uh, such uh, studies are uh, such at least such uh, such problems do exist for soft start, and I think that is uh, important to investigate before choosing uh, choosing this uh, method. Um, yeah, any questions or I mean, do we take them up after? Okay. Yeah, we'll take maybe at the end. Uh, OK, perfect. Yeah, somebody has a question they will ask anyway. OK, yeah. um, so. Now, so then the, in the previous um, slides, I was basically focusing more on the HVDC uh, link and uh, the offshore network, so the more the transients. Uh, now, what we did is we started to narrow down our focus area into towards the grid forming wind turbine side. So, uh, how, what different controls exist and how they behave in in the scope of this energization. Um, HVDC connected energization study. And I, uh, this is not really a very general structure, but it's an attempt to show some sort of um, structure to the grid forming, to, to few of the grid forming controls that we studied. But the main idea of grid forming control is that uh, it has to behave as a voltage source, right? So there is, uh, there is a voltage controller that controls the voltage and then a frequency control loop that controls the frequency. Now, due to, well, from, from knowledge of SMPS or, or electric machine drives, it is very known, well known that a uh, single voltage control loop is, is not the best because there is a very, um, there's an important need for the current control to limit over currents during, especially during falls and transients. So there is this sort of cascaded uh, structure in some controls, very, very clear, but in some others kind of uh, mixed and manipulated. Although this is not essential because you can um, limit currents also for example through virtual resistance loops which which for example is optional as shown here but yeah this is this these loops are um, let's say provide some enhanced performance issues and then um, for for the um, so so typical grid following controls they they require synchronism right so there is an external point of connection and you regulate this the power exchange in the grid um, with some power controls but in case of grid forming methods um, this the frequency is set by the the method right so it's a voltage it's an oscillator and therefore there is a frequency control implemented and the most common uh, um, use is in grid connected mode or well microgrids they are now studying islanded operation and so on but uh, typically it has been with grid connected uh, operation in most at least in the literature quite a lot so the most common is of course using a phase lock loop uh, which is in in um, in some sense uh, voltage based synchronism method right because it it uses the voltage and then calculates the, the phase and then so on. Uh, but there is a lot of problems with using a phase lock loop, for example, in unbalanced or distorted voltage conditions, and uh, it can lead to instabilities. So there have been a lot of, of course, enhancements to the, nor the, the phase lock loop itself, but there are some alternative synchronism methods, the most common being a power-based synchronization. Um, which you see here. So uh, as opposed to the voltage based synchronization, you have a power based synchronization, which is something like what synchronous generators do. So based on uh, the, the power flow, you can then regulate the or you can modulate the frequency. And 
why this is let's say possible is because the the the, the swing equation for example of the virtual of the synchronous machine is or has a similar structure to that of a pll so we can translate one variable into the other and therefore there is this um, there and that led to the development of the virtual synchronous machine as a grid forming control uh, in in that uh, how can a converter mimic the behavior of a synchronous generator um, i will i will not go into details on yet but uh, yeah please feel free to to know ask ask me and then finally there is the outer power controllers as you see here, which are required to to allow um, proper sharing of load, uh, whether it be also non-linear load between between the parallel operation between the parallel grid forming units, right? And uh, it's it's important to note that in grid forming um, uh, control, the power is not. So, so it's a voltage source and therefore the power demand is set by the load, right? And um, the, the aim is to supply whatever power is being asked uh, by the load. And the simplest method for, for this power, for power sharing is again, what comes from synchronous machines being operated in power systems and uh, what has been developed also in microgrids is uh, group based sharing, right? But uh, it's very easy to implement. It's uh, there is no communication required, uh, which is quite important, I think, for these large offshore wind power plants spanning across um, many kilometers and com having communication links can be uh, uh, a weak point. Uh, while on the other hand, in microgrids, this is not really um, a worry, I think, but uh, that being so, um, group based are is group based power controllers are quite easy to implement, uh, very flexible, uh, high reliability, but they they suffer from an inherent trade off right between the load sharing and the the, the voltage or frequency deviation, right? Um, plus, there comes a lot of non linear load sharing problems due to harmonics, especially in the scope of um, Powertronic rich uh, grids, such as the offshore uh, grid uh, for a wind power plant, and to to kind of um, to mitigate these issues, typically it's it's common to have a virtual impedance, which uh, or, or it, it uh, virtual impedance can be used to, for example, provide additional harmonic troop characteristics, uh, some filtering, uh, additional damping based on specific harmonic or uh, improve even the trade off between the current harmonic sharing and um, total harmonic uh, distortion of the voltage by adjusting the output impedance. So it's a it's it's essentially a virtual output impedance at different frequencies um, without the any loss in efficiency or so. So so this 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 method is um, another um, let's say feature to to enhance the performance of the controls um, uh, which is not just limited to grid forming controls but uh, yeah that's why this sort of i try to have this structure here but because it kind of without going into details of the millions of different controls that exist and uh, yeah if if we can talk more if more clarification is needed of course and what we did is um, so so grid forming the, the control point part is is a huge field of research in its own. I mean they have been historically known by different names in different areas, right? So uh, it's an oscillator in microelectronics or uh, in the converter world. It's I think mostly uh, been developed for for UPS applications and recently has been in more. Uh, as a hot topic in microgrids and power systems, um, even I think voltage injection it's called in some in some areas, especially for islanded operation. And even I mean there are there exists a, a lot of um, grid forming controls. Um, many even have uh, different implementations, different enhancements, and 
um, pros and with all with their pros and cons. But um, what we try to do is, uh, it was a very interesting area, of course, for for me to to get lost in this. But I think uh, Nikos, who's my supervisor, he 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 had to, or maybe he had to ensure that I don't get distracted from time to time. But what we did is we tried to narrow down um, or at least select um, four different controls. And what we tried to do is uh, it, there was no there was no systematic study that we did, but we kind of tried to pick the most common ones that are, let's say, the most popular ones that are known and the ones that have been developed for for quite some time have been researched into for quite some time and out of those families if you want to call it that we try to pick the their most simplest implementations uh, without any extra features and so on to to sort of get a very uh, very crude understanding or feel for how they work and um, where the where the what what valves can be tuned and and so on and so forth and we we implemented them into our wind turbine model. So this is what I was talking about before is that our wind turbine model right now uh, or at that point in time of the PhD was a very was a was an average model and we were just changing the controls and then studying how they react to the uh, to the energization sequence. So uh, this is snapshots from the papers, but if you want, I can I can open them when when we go into the discussions. Um, so here you see the frequency and at different stages of the energization sequence, there is different transients um, and different sort of in uh, vulnerability to some oscillations and so on. And also from the uh, the of the, uh, the the transient behavior of the voltage um, output of the the control. And um, I will not show the details of this these grid forming controls in itself um, in the structures right here um, because otherwise it can I think maybe get too boring for some at least and uh, but yeah if if you want to know more please uh, do raise up the question and I can always bring up the paper um, and through this study what we found out is uh, well, that of course different controls are respond transiently uh, in different ways, but overall there is, uh, I think, uh, overall all can kind of um, work in this um, energization scenario. But during the process of tuning them, we, I mean, it's a that's a whole other. That's a challenge, or we spend a lot of time during the lockdown, <laughs> but uh, we kind of uh, got some sort of insight or feeling for the different parameters of each of the different controls and how they impact their uh, stabilities and uh, what's the limitations, if in in some sense, if you may, for for the different controls and so on, and uh, to get so so it was a very interesting. Um, uh, study personally for for understanding grid forming controls as uh, in in themselves, so not really caring about the the energization of the HVDC link, but using that as just a application and seeing how um, the different eigenvalues of each of the different controls are sensitive to different parameters and what's the ranges of each and uh, but we, we didn't do a very methodic systematic study. It was more um, in the process of tuning them. We found this uh, this sort of interesting um, areas of research, of course, that uh, many other I think groups across the world are doing on a more full time basis. Um, so it was our lockdown well spent in at least from from my side. <laughs> Yeah, and so that gives uh, uh, hopefully not too boring um, overview of the major outcomes that we have had uh, till now and or till till the last year. And what we have, we are, what we are now working on is um, 
we are focusing inside the wind farm. So we have kind of looked at this stage in which we do, uh, which can, which cares more, which looks into more the, the HVDC uh, link and how the, the wind power plant as a whole would be impacted by the transients here. But now what we do is we focus inside the wind farm and especially in the wind turbine. So detailing the wind turbine model a bit more and to uh, study study transients inside the wind farm. So between the strings and so on. And um, this was the previous model that we were using for each wind turbine. So it's a voltage source with the filter and then the transformer. And the transformer, as you see, is not is just a pure impedance, uh, electrical impedance. There is no magnetic um, inverse saturation, etc. model. But then what we did is we added the switching model of the grid side converter. Still, the, con the controls are the same. So the normal grid forming controls that we have studied here. Um, but with this time also a finite DC link. So with a very average sort of rotor side control um, uh, to control the DC link of the wind turbine. Now, I am um, currently in between whether it is required to implement the mechanical side of the, the generator, but not, not to the extent of actually modeling the machines and everything, but just having even some aerodynamic equations and uh, electromechanical, the inertia, inertial two mass equation and so on and so forth, just to study how the, the rotor speed and etc. behave. But what we, right now what we have is that we kind of have some uh, ramp rate limit and uh, we, we try to, implement the this the DC link control with a slow enough bandwidth uh, to allow for speed controls on the mechanical side. So we kind of from some literature, it's not really the most validated, let's say, but some studies have been done with the mechanical um, or at least in the recent years, very, very recently, some studies have been done on the mechanical side of of the control in, in scope of grid forming and so we try to keep the, the limits in mind to ensure that, OK, this is not too too fast. Uh, otherwise, it would be out of out of the capabilities of the wind turbine itself. And uh, and then, yes, of course, for the wind turbine transformer, we um, also included the in Russian saturation characteristics to have a more sort of uh, to create more problems basically for ourselves. <laughs> And what we have just recently concluded um, is a study looking into using virtual resistance in the grid forming control. So if you remember, I can, I'll not go back, but uh, in the grid forming control structure I showed, there is a virtual impedance loop, right? Which can be used for added benefits. Uh, and one of the uh, use of that loop is that it can be set as a resistance um, without any of course real resistance causing loss in efficiency um, and this is important for startup uh, when the generator connects to the grid and this is a common approach i think it's called virtual soft start in in microgrids but um, what we can do is we can have a high value of resistance in the in the at the start of connection and then just gradually reduce it to zero to finally, uh, it's like kind of like a PAR, but programmable. And this, this is um, a, a mimicking a uh, physical soft starter that was used in fixed speed wind turbines with thyristors and resistors, um, kind of representing a high impedance in the beginning, in the start of connection. And then once the transient is uh, gone, uh, just everything is bypassed. And this is another um, actually way to control the uh, currents, so to prevent overcurrents during falls and um, other transients. But I think uh, we have not looked into that that scope yet. But uh, there are some study from uh, I think University of Lille, which which have looked into how a virtual resistance can be used instead of a current control loop you know, uh, to, to limit the currents. Um, but there is some 
requirements of uh, or there is a bandwidth requirement that needs to be met uh, to for it to work properly so uh, but we are we have not looked into that um, from that scope and what we did is we studied first the it's it's uh, benefit in the scope of a single islanded wind turbine energizing its transformer so instead so we compared it to a direct online energization versus uh, having a real actual pir or versus having um, this virtual impedance programmed into the grid forming control of the grid side converter and we also did some sensitivity studies which uh, to give to get some insight into how you can choose the value of uh, the initial ri and time constant t of this of this um, virtual resistance um, there's a very good scope for of course since it's programmable you can essentially use any shape of virtual resistance you want but yeah that has not been uh, that's another distraction i think uh, which uh, uh, nikos would not uh, like <laughs> and then what we did is once a single wind turbine is energized we can uh, we studied also the drown the, the downstream transformer energization so we didn't implement the wind turbine yet because we don't we're not looking at the synchronization but it was mainly how this virtual so if one single grid forming wind turbine has a virtual resistance loop in its control can it pr pr provide any benefits to the inrush of the uh, downstream transformers and of course the the dreaded uh, sympathetic interaction that comes from energizing these multiple transformers uh, especially if there is some residual flux present right and we we kind of did some studies with comparing the best and worst case residual flux and it was interesting to see what the limitations of this virtual resistance is and um, what can be done and um, yeah and then finally we also what we did is we implemented this at the wind power plant level so um, having the this is this is how our wind power plant looks so it's a single string with individual wind turbines and then an aggregated string and then uh, rest of the wind turbines are aggregated um, but we start them up simultaneously. Uh, I'll repeat here because we are not looking into the synchronization yet. And we implement the virtual resistance here in the controls of this wind farm, let's say, and how that can um, deal with the energization of this big uh, HVDC transformer. You know, and what what are the limitations and what are what can be done. And uh, I don't think I've included any. Yeah. I have not included any results here, but um, yes, if you feel free, we are in the process of publishing it, but uh, well, I still have to submit it, but we, uh, feel free and I can bring up the slides in the supplementary um, section. And this leads me to the, I think the last part, which is what's next for, for from the study, uh, from for my PhD perspective. I, I'll end here with um, with my presentation. I there is some time still, but uh, yeah, any questions can be are, are most welcome now. Thanks, thanks, Jan. It's an interesting presentation. I just have like two quick questions. Eh? Yeah, you you showed a, a block diagram of the, of the control loop for the grid forming converter. I think that was slide 19. I'm just curious why you what what the role of the synchronization block is for this grid converting grid forming converter. And then also you you talked about this power synchronization scheme being something that's coming in place to replace the PLL. Do you, do you know if it has been implemented anywhere yet or is it something still under de development? OK, so uh, it's I know it's called synchronization loop, but it's more you can think of it like it being the oscillator because this is this is where this is the the controller that will provide um, the the frequency. I mean, 
the frequency signal right to the oscillator and the theta if you may um, and the the power synchronous the power based synchronization is essentially how the the virtual synchronous machine works so you have uh, power based um, the, the power error that goes into a swing equation and then you add that to the frequency reference and that's what I think the Scottish power uh, renewables people must have implemented because they implemented a virtual synchronous machine control in their grid forming onshore wind power plant test. Um, but uh, I, I don't have any details from them, but what they say is that it's the virtual synchronous method, machine method, because it's the most, I think, uh, researched upon and it's quite simple to understand, I think, from a, coming from a power system perspective. And uh, I would say it's not really a replacement for the PLL, it's just an alternative. Um, you can get, I think, uh, very good behavior from PLL or at least having advanced PLLs. Uh, I think National HVDC Center has done some studies in that in that scope, but they they are kind of two different ways of not synchronizing, but ensuring uh, the frequency is um, around 50 hertz. Yeah, so so keep yeah for the DQ for the DQ controller. OK, thanks. Then, then perhaps in the next slide, you, you talked of state space analysis. Having done state space analysis, I'm just curious what, what methods or what tools did you use? OK, so um, what we did is what uh, so we had a very simple mat. So we basically used MATLAB. Um, for the S for the steady space um, analysis, and it's not really a very um, let's say comprehensive analysis in terms of eigenvalues and participation factors and so on and so forth. What I did is that already there has been research, especially for some of the controls, uh, it's very important the, the the virtual synchronous machine in in that regard. So it's more getting the 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 feeling. From there and then what we did is we tried tuning our own control in the scope of this black star scenario but the most i would say the, the, the tool that was used if you want to know is is matlab or simulink yeah so i just use uh, uh, standard control theory uh, very basic uh, control theory um, okay. because the, the scope was not to really investigate the controls in itself and it can it's a very huge i think task it's a maybe it's a phd in itself to do all these kind of things but uh, and okay. many other people have worked also i think in alborg i know some people have worked in this in this area but uh, yeah. yeah so so what you had was not like a detailed mode of the converter with all the modulation schemes and all that stuff no, so I did just a very st st uh, simple uh, control uh, diagram and then linear, like a linear. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, but there are some other PhDs if you want to know who are working on the control point of view of, of or uh, let's say for tuning MMCs and stuff. So they are looking into more the the detailed uh, steady state analysis and nonlinear. Uh, control theory and stuff like this, which I can I can guide you to if you want. But for my for my for this study, my interest was only just the very top, let's say, um, layer. OK, thank you. So any other questions? from anyone in the call. This is Nikos. It's not really a question, but since uh, Anubhav brought me up several times, I think uh, Anubhav did a lot of work, but at the same time, probably from his presentation, you saw that he has also tendency to go in all directions. So <laughs> that's maybe a justification for trying to pull him back on a, on a path, but... Uh, 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 that's the I job of a <laughs> I would, uh, <laughs> yes. I would encourage you to 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 contact him for uh, for many details. There, there is much more details 
behind the, the things that he presented in, uh, uh, in, in this slide. Thanks, Nico. Thanks, really. But overall, it's it's very interesting presentation. Well, so I have seen, um, I've seen, not seen before, like people are just uh, in the call for one and a half hour, even though you're <laughs> presenting continuously without a break, because it's you made it really interesting. So it's like a story. OK, that's good to know. I not like <laughs> you cut the too many technical details and you presented overall. I think it's very important uh, for a community uh, where you are targeting here because there are managers and then technical people. OK, perfect. Yeah, I was actually so, worried about that because I finished yeah. the presentation only yesterday, <laughs> slimmer, but yeah. I was trying to keep a sort of a balance if you want, if you may. Yeah. Well, I think it gave really an overview. But okay. anyway, I think you have recorded this, right? You were recording. I I tried. I think I I tried to set it up, but let's see. <laughs> let us see. Yeah, you just go up and then stop it. It will come. But anyway, you share the presentation with the um, uh, team, and then uh, they will forward it. With an yes. Interesting. Thank you, Anubhav. Thanks a lot, JC, and thank you everyone for for the uh, well for sitting in. <laughs> Yeah. for for this time yeah and uh, please feel free to contact me or nikos or jc or other people who are logged in from from dq um regarding this uh, um uh, work and uh, we can um at least the papers that are already published it's almost i think all are open access so there will not be a problem in sharing them and everything so yeah uh, feel free to message me. Sure. Thanks, Anubhav. Then uh, have a nice day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Lot. And all the best in Thanks, uh, lot, Bath and Pal. Thanks, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you, Anubhav. Thanks. Thanks. Have a nice afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot.